Welcome, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment while we're waiting for people to join. Enjoy this welcome from Anne Moreau. Hello, everybody. My name is Anne Moreau from the Menu Moreau in Chablis, and I am the president of the Communication Commission for the Bourgogne Wine Board. First of all, I want to thank you for attending this seminar online today about Chablis wines and tell you how much I miss not being able to be physically with you today, but it is due to the sanitary situation. Now, I think you would like to have some news about the Harvest 2020, and this is good news, obviously. Uh, in Chablis, we started the harvesting quite early. Uh, as for Domaine Wimoro, for example, we started on August 27th, which is very early. But this doesn't mean that it's a, a hot vintage, it just it is an early vintage. And this is mainly due to the fact that the overall vegetative cycle was very early this year. And also we noticed a lack of water. Uh, we got some rains at the end of, of August, but it impacted some parcels and not others. So the average of quantity um, is quite disparate from one place to another. But overall, if we look at the five last year's average of crop, we are in the average with a 52 hectoliters per hectare, which is not so bad. And in terms of quality, surprisingly, harvest 2020 will be very classic Chablis style. Uh, we can compare it to a 2017 vintage with a lot of acidity, freshness, minerality, but also good fruitiness and very nice ripeness. So at last we have a nice good news for the vintage 2020. Anyway, I think that now it's time for you to start this online seminar. So I do want to thank you again for attending this seminar on Chablis Wines and I look forward to welcoming you again soon in Chablis. Thank you again and enjoy. Welcome May. Everyone, this is May Ata, May Mata Alia. <laughs> See, I tripped you. I told you. Yeah, it was like I'm practicing, practicing, and then all I did was mess it up. Just famous for me. Unbelievable. Uh, okay. anyway, uh, May is uh, uh, the owner in, of a consulting company called In the Grape. She works as an educator for many organizations, including Sapexa. And she is, uh, I think it's very interesting that she abandoned a career in graphic design in favor of a passion for wine, which I think is great. We have been going back and forth quite a bit. I'm really excited to share this lecture with her. Uh, she is definitely an expert on the region. And uh, you all may know me, I'm Ron Edwards. I'm director of wine education for Winebow and uh, happy to be doing so as now. So welcome and uh, how about I get us going with the, uh, the PowerPoint. Excellent. Thank you for having By me. By the way, yeah, you're welcome. Absolutely. By the way, everybody, if you have questions, please enter those into the q and I will not be monitoring the chat uh, window. It's, it just becomes too much. So uh, anything that, that comes up along the way, pop it in the Q&A and I will interrupt May um, to either answer it or have her answer it, depending on which one of us knows the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and away we go. Take it away, May. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ron. Um, yes, I'm very, very excited to be here. I really um, love the wines of Chablis and um, I've had the opportunity to visit the region once just as a tourist predating pre my wine career. And um, I was staying in Paris and I decided to do a day trip up to the region. And then um, once again, through um, the BIVB, where I was there um, on a really, really terrific program that they do uh, for Burgundy or Bourgogne wine educators. And um, so we got to spend some time in uh, Bourgogne and Bonne, went up to Chablis several times and then went back again a couple of times. So it's a region that I really love to visit. And um, I think for me, it's in a way, it's a wine region that I described the wines from there being almost reflective because you have to really dig deep into the wines of Chablis to get, it's about nuance, which is something that I really um, focus on when I'm tasting the wines from there. It's, you're not talking about sort of really seismic differences as much as we're talking about nuance. Um, and that's something that's really lovely. Uh, so this opportunity, and thank you again so much, Ron, for, for taking the time to do this. It's been really fun working with you on it. Um, it is, uh, it's been enabled by the BIPB. This is part of an initiative, an educational initiative that they're doing. Um, I, we did a similar program a couple of years ago, actually, we did a really uh, terrific kind of a, an all day immersion. 
But obviously today that's not possible. So we've kind of pivoted, which is the word of the year, um, along with you're muted. Um, so we pivoted to um, doing it online. And, um, but that is, uh, you know, through their agency in the US, which is Topexa, that's how I get to do this um, presentation with you today. Yes, so the, the uh, other, so the three words, right? Pivoted, muted, and mask. Those are three words of 2020. And, and four, vote. Okay. Anyway, yes, we digress. We digress. <laughs> um, all right. So we're going to just talk very, very briefly about Bourgogne and Chablis, where Chablis fits in this in this larger framework. So of course, um, we're all wine lovers here, and most of you are probably wine you know, industry folks. So this is not news to you. When we say Bourgogne, maybe the reputation of that region precedes its actual production. Because if we look at numbers, we're really not talking about a vast wine producing region. Uh, about 4% of wines coming out of France are actually coming out of Bourgogne. But within that, um, Chablis plays a pretty significant role. So 16% of wines actually are made in the region of uh, Bourgogne. It's a very important export co product for them as well. Um, and um, in terms of production, they're making about 40 million bottles a year in a good year. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, climate and how um, the vintage size can vary significantly from year to year. They, they can have some, um, some issues um, with, with vintage variation. And then within that, the U.S. plays a pretty important role. We're not the number one market, but we are the number two export market for them. So um, it's a you know it's a very important market. And I will say that for me, and I'm I'm saying this sort of anecdotally, when um, oftentimes we get a little bit um, swayed by a lot of what's going on in the wine industry and what's trendy and what's hot and what's the next big thing and we sort of sometimes forget to revisit the classics. So very selfishly, I say, when I was given the opportunity to do this program, um, I really enjoyed going back and having a reason to dig deeply into the Chablis region and to taste the wines with more focus. And the wines are gorgeous. And I think, you know, sometimes shame on me for having forgotten that, <laughs> um, but they really are beautiful wines and I, uh, love having had the opportunity to go back and retaste them. And so I, you know, if nothing else, I hope that this will re-excite you um, and re-intrigue you to revisit those wines and stock them and talk about them and sell them and share them and show the love. And um, I'm done with that slide, Rob. Yeah, it, only, <laughs> it, only, it only takes one sip to remind yourself of why you're exactly. never forgetfully. I already started. I had one sip before I go. So what? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's um, sitting here. I haven't had it yet, but uh, uh, so you have more sure restraint you than I do, perhaps, because I was going to have another sip of coffee, and I thought, "Hey, wait, much, much better palate cleanser." <laughs> well, no. so, um, so <laughs> let's, let's delve into the uniqueness here, and so let me address this part, and then we'll move on. And the idea okay. of latitude makes a huge difference in winemaking, and it's a there are combinations of factors that make a place a good place to grow grapevines that we turn into wine. Okay, so, and also then we throw into the factors of where did those grape varieties originate? So in the world of Vitis vinifera, the original uh, Eurocentric, what we think of as wine grapes, even though there are plenty of other grapes turned into wine that are not in the vinifera uh, subset, um, they love 30 to 50 degrees north and 30 to 50 degrees south. And part of that is length of day, uh, extended daylight hours in the growing season because you're further away from the equator. Secondly, they, they really are not plants super well suited to hot, like really hot is not good. So if it is a place that could be really hot, like Mendoza, Argentina, then we need and uh, we need elevation or something to cause a maritime effect, whatever that is, okay? And so that's true on both sides of the poles and you can, or both sides of the equator. And you can see this strip across here that this covers the majority of things we think of as winemaking areas. And there's just good botanical reasons for that. And, um, and so when we talk about Chablis, it's way up towards 50, uh, 47 degrees. And so take us through the, the regions. Yeah, so um, when we are, we did mention that this uh, Chablis is part of the Bourgogne wine region. So we've got five different regions. It is the most north um, and it's almost, a, you know, it's, it, it's, it's quite um, a, a significant difference if you're driving from, um, 
Paris to Chablis, you're looking at about two hours, but it is almost physically removed from the rest of the heart of that Côte d'Or strip and then going down into the Chalonnais and the Maconie. So it is a little bit further removed. The soils are quite different. The climate is quite different. And if we actually move on to the next slide, Ron, um, we can see in terms of latitude, because you were mentioning the 30th to 50th parallel, um, and that you know, we, we, we talk about the significance of that zone for viticulture. And here with Chablis, we are talking about a wine region that's at the 47th parallel. So not the coldest wine region, um, but certainly uh, it, it, it's quite a cool climate. We would typically describe the climate in that region as continental climate. So continental climate for any students that need refreshers means you're fairly inland, no major maritime influences, so very different from a maritime influence such as Bordeaux. So what typically defines this kind of climate is that you tend to have more extremes, extreme dryness, extreme coldness, extreme um, warmth. So um, I actually checked the weather today in Chablis because I was intrigued to see how it stacks up to the weather here, which by the way was about 53 degrees this morning. Um, and it was already 79 degrees, um, granted they're a few hours ahead of us, um, but today the high was going to hit 80 um, in Chablis. So they do tend to have a fairly warm September. Um, and so that's one of the things that really kind of um, brings that harvest to an end, even though as we heard from Anne today, um, they harvested pretty early this year. She said in August, I, I didn't catch the exact date, Ron, I don't know if you did, but she said in, in August they started, but it's a kind of record-breaking early harvest. So that's, again, something we're seeing. Um, but having said that, it is, um, it's a fairly, you know, the whole region of, of uh, Bourgogne is rather long. It's 143 miles. But, you know, Chablis is, is quite separated from the mainland. And so, in a way, and we sort of also see it in the fact that we talk about Bourgogne, and then we talk about the wines of Chablis almost as a separate entity, even though legally, they don't, they're not a separate entity. They do fall under the, the edges of the BIVB, but we do sort of look at it as a slightly different way. Um, so let's um, keep rolling. I think we're going to talk a little bit about the history of yeah. the region. Let's do that. Yeah, I always find Chablis to be more akin to talking about Champagne, champagne. Than Burgundy. and uh, perhaps, perhaps that's an accurate thing. I'm not sure. They're just they're closer to, together than for sure than bone. Um, so, you know, Burgundy as a whole has a very similar history to what happens in Chablis. So you have the Romans who introduced vines. Um, Chardonnay as a grape did actually originate in France, even though from my last webinar, we know that it also sort of happened to be in Lebanon at about the same time. So we're assuming it got there with the Phoenicians or something. Um, and then it just progresses slowly. The major influence though, as in through all of France, especially Burgundy, is the influence of the, mon the monastic movements in the church and um, feudal lords and, and on through history with actual kings and dukes granting land to the church. Those, those properties were then managed by those who could read and write at the time, which was a little less common. Well, let's just, it was a lot less common then. So their ability to read and write and the fact that they had all that time to dedicate their vineyard service as a service to God spent all of this extra effort in defining that region. And um, those plots of land that they decided, man, that's a great place to grow grapes. They're still defined pretty much the same today because hundreds of years of effort have gone into uh, defining what we will now call climat. Um, it's, it's interesting also that um, the, the, some, there is uh, some thinking that some of the earliest plantings of Chardonnay actually were in Chablis before they came to the mainland um, of the, the rest of Bagania, that they were by the monks, by the Cistercian monks up in, um, in Chablis. And you know, the other thing on that timeline I just wanted to mention is also that it is, you know, in, in France, they did start their um, appellation system in 1956. It was when um, the first appellations were granted in, in um, 36, 35 and 36, um, and Chablis and the Grand Cru were is, is given their AOC in 38. Um, the only one that wasn't part of that initial um, classification was the Petit Chablis, which we're going to talk a little bit about, but that, that gained its appellation in 1944. So just a small interjection then. There you go. And let's talk about this, because this, uh, anyone who listens to my webinars knows I like to talk about rocks, even though I'm not a geologist, I, I like to play one on TV. So uh, <laughs> limestone, limestone is one of the most important um, 
ingredients to vineyard soils, right? You have limestone or calcareous based soils. And then the other super famous thing is uh, volcanic based soils. Um, this particular formation of Burgundy, the White Cliffs of Dover, a major portion of Champagne uh, uprises again in Cote d'Or, then it comes back to the surface again in Sancerre. This Kimmeridgian chain is an uplift and then an erosion of what was the seafloor during the Kimmeridgian period. And it was a, um, a deposit of crustaceans basically to form limestone. Uh, and it's a mix of limestone and clay that gets into this calcareous Kimmeridgian marl. And that is the magic when we start talking about Chablis vineyards and also when we talk about Greater Burgundy in general. And so that's where all of this focus on minerality, this focus on soil for this region especially is all about that picture right there. Yeah. I love that you can see the actual seashells in that rock and we'll, we'll have another opportunity to see that. So that's a, that, that's a great explanation, Arm, because I think what you really also see here is that, as you mentioned, this area was under um, was underwater. Um, and so, and that what you're seeing here is sort of these different layers of soils that, that form. So the Camaritian soils are the older soils of the region. They, as we, we, we saw in the town, it's about 150 million years old. Um, and then what you see in this picture of, with this layer above it in the, um, in the kind of a bl blue gray are the Portlandian soils. And these are younger soils that deposited over the Kimmeridgian soils. So I love when we say younger soils because really we're talking about soils that are about 120 million years old. So 120 to 130 million years old versus 150 year old soils. Um, but the Kimmeridgian soils, as you mentioned, formed during the Jurassic period. So this was part of the Jurassic period, one of the later uh, Jurassic periods. Um, and you have this mix of limestone and clay, but what really differentiates this Kimmeridgian from the Portlandian soils, not that we care whether one is 150 and one is 120 million years old, it's the fact that you have this presence of fossils. Um, and you have areas where you have more erosion. And so if you, again, if you're looking at this picture, um, and I failed to mention that you've got the Saran River. So that's really part of what differentiates and bisects this wine region. Um, this is a tributary of the Yon River. And it dissects, it bisects the region of Chablis into the left bank and the right bank, which Oftentimes, we don't really use these references. I know when we're used to sort of talking left bank, grand bank, when we talk about Bordeaux, not so much about when you talk about Chablis. But what's really interesting, I want to kind of direct your eyes to the southern part of this um, cross section, and you see where it says the Grand Cru de Chablis. And right there, you can see that area is really close to the river. There was a lot more erosion. So you've got this um, confluence of exposure. You have some of the steeper gradients there, but then also more. Um, you've had more erosion happening. So more of that Kimmeridgian fossils and stuff are exposed. Um, and that's part of what really kind of differentiates this one little area. And we're going to focus more on that a little bit later, but we really differentiates that. And then what the other thing that's really interesting to see is you go from that to this area right next to it, juxtaposed right next to it, which this topsoil of Portlandian soil. So, um, you know, it really is a matter of kind of thinking of the Portlandian soils as a layer that deposited over their slightly younger soil. And then when we're looking at the region of the Petit Chablis, that appellation, that's what distinguishes the Chablis from the Petit Chablis is the presence of those um, Portlandian soils. And let's, let's look at it on topographical. Yeah. And this is, again, a really um, a great way to look at it again. Um, on the left-hand side, these kind of, these areas sort of look like these fingers that are carved out coming out of the river path. And then as we're going further down, you can really kind of see um, the different soil exposition. Um, and then some areas where you have some of the Oxfordian um, soils, which are predate the, um, the Kimmeridgian soil. So you're really kind of seeing this in terms of layers from the oldest being on our snapshot, what we're seeing here. So um, Oxfordian and Kimmeridgian soils are both considered our Jurassic um, era soils, but the Oxfordian are a little bit older. So then you have the Oxfordian, you have the Kimmeridgian, you have the upper Kimmeridgian, and then they have the Portlandian. So it's sort of a milfeu, if you will, of different um, soil ages. Is there anything you wanted to add, Ron, that I failed to mention? No, I was just going to say that, no, no, the fingers are, are good things for people to realize that these are things formed by little creek beds and water erosion over the course of a long, long period of time. And, and when we do this, 
it starts to make a lot of sense because, oh, that soil type, whether it's exposed, the angle to the sun, now we have this overlay of quality of vineyard site listed here on the map. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's great. I, I love that when we were looking at working this presentation, we both were like, well, this, this slide should go right after the other one because this really kind of tells the arc and tells the story. So you can see the layering, you can see the drops, and you can really see here how it actually lays out. Kind of going back to what I was saying before, you've got that red slope, which is our Grand Cru, and then right behind that, you've got the Petit Chablis because here, we, again, we're sort of talking about an incline and then um, these soils that are slightly higher elevation. More often than not, the Petit Chablis you will find on a plateau. Um, it's a little bit um, higher elevation usually. And again, we sort of talked about the slightly different soils. And then you can see you've got all these different Premier Cru. So part of what is really interesting about um, the Premier Cru in Chablis is that you do have these very, again, I kind of mentioned this at the beginning, it's really about nuance. So to your point, we're talking about these um, different premier crews that have different, slightly different orientations. Maybe one is south, maybe one is a little bit southeast, southwest. Sometimes you have a little both in one. One could be in an amphitheater. One can have more exposure, one can have less exposure. And that's really where it becomes an issue of nuance. In some cases, you have more commergian soils coming through. In some cases, you have slightly deeper um, commergian soils. So again, all of these different nuances, and that's where um, this kind of purity that you find when you're analyzing the different premier crews of Chablis side by side, it's, 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 as I mentioned, it's really about, it's about nuance. It's about kind of picking up these different um, exposures and how they differentiate. To take it into broad strokes, just to give people kind of a, a, a point of entry, um, we're looking at this with the, with the river running through it. On the left-hand side, typically we say the left bank has the cooler clima, um, and on the right hand side, usually you have warmer clima, a lot of it having to do with the exposure. So again, we're sort of broad stroking it here, but the left bank, you're mostly talking about wines that are um, vineyards that are east facing. So they're just getting morning sun. The ones on the right bank are, you're generally talking about west facing. So generally they're getting longer sun time, sunshine hours. Again, broad stroking it just to sort of give a point of entry for students to try to remember some of those clues. Yep, that, that right bank is covered with sites of southwest face which at this climate this ex this latitude that's absolutely critical to getting that next level of ripeness. Exactly. We'll add also that when you stand for instance in Monte de Tenere which is on the right bank the top of Monte de Tenere is different than the lower section based exactly. on uh, erosion and a few other things up at the top is just all white stones everywhere and then you get down and the soil is deeper so even there you have a nuance from one producer's holding to another and this is why you know so this picture really points it out to me this Kimmeridgean I, I don't know why they call it soil it's, it's a rock on the left uh, <laughs> is, is an example of how this conglomeration of, of marl and clay and you can see roots could penetrate that roots can there's water being retained inside that, that rock. The Portlandian on the other side, that's really hard and cold and, 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 and rugged and well-drained and just not as friendly to a vine as this, this conglomeration on the other side. And that's really the magic of why Portlandian is going to be petitably, whereas Kimridgian is going to be for the better, better sites. Yeah, just to also mention um, the another part what really differentiates them aside from the texture that you're talking about um, is that you do have this marine fossil presence in the Kimmeridgean soils, which again kind of brings some of that added complexity. And because they're more clay um, soils or clay calcareous soils, um, they do tend to be slightly cooler soils, which also means your roots are, are in more water retaining soils. So that kind of slows down that maturation arc a little bit more, whereas the Petit Chablis um, they're quite well drained. You do have the stones, but they're quite well drained. And so they tend to also be earlier maturing um, wines. So they, you know, very, very different characters. I think sometimes um, people kind of uh, don't think much or don't, don't really um, consider Petit Chablis. Oftentimes I think it's sort of forgotten a little bit. I think it's a really charming appellation. I think it, they're just very different. And to me, the, the Petit Chablis tends to just make wines that are a lot more accessible and more fruity, a little bit more open. They don't have the same minerality that you will find usually in a, in a Chablis. Um, but I think there's something very pretty about them. So, and we'll have a chance to talk about that a little bit more. 
And as the world continues to get warmer, it's going to be even better. We do have one uh, comment slash question already put in. And if you have a resource, maybe we can email it out to the attendees afterwards. Uh, the previous map, the, the, the overlay map, I think is what she was talking about, the topographical map. Um, is uh, incredible. I'd love to have a tangible copy as it printed somewhere. So if, maybe help me provide a resource to them afterwards. Okay. And I saw someone had wrote, raised a hand, but if you if you need something, then please just put it in the Q and A because um, it's too much to manage otherwise. Yeah. Um, and so now it's one single varietal. It's a beauty. This is the best flashcard region in the world because there's only one. <laughs> so. I love it. I love it. I mean, I think that's and that's again sort of when we're talking about that. It's it's you know. Chardonnay, I mean, can you think of a grape variety that's become almost more generic than that? I mean, maybe at this point Pinot Grigio, but yeah, I mean, it's it's just, it's, it's a grape variety that, in a way, I love talking about and I love teaching about it because I think it's maybe one of the most misunderstood grape varieties. It's the most confusing grape varieties because, you know, you're hard pressed to make an, one example of what Chardonnay is. Um, there are so many different variations of that expression of Chardonnay. Um, but, but here is the only place in the world, to my mind, that you can really kind of examine that grape in its, in its most pure, most translucent form. Because we talk about Chardonnay as being a vehicle for terroir, a vehicle for winemaking, a vehicle for um, vintage and climate. And um, here, it's one of the few places in the world where you're really making it without a lot of the, dare I say, crutches that other wine regions use. Um, and so, you know, and we are growing it in a more marginal climate. So it very, I mean, there's a reason, you know, that, that Chablis is, is the iconic region. So just to kind of talk a little bit about Chardonnay, because I, you know, one of the reasons I love to teach is makes, makes me go back to books <laughs> and dig up some notes. And so I, I wasn't aware that Chardonnay today is the second most widely planted white grape in all of France. Mm. Um, and, and the first one being Uni Blanc, and we know where that goes, Cognac. Um, so it's the most widely planted white grape variety today. And overall in the list of top five, it's actually the number five holistically between red and white. Um, and a lot of that is now planted in the south, in the, um, you know, in the Pays d'Oc. Uh, because you can put the name Chardonnay on the on the label and, and the wine sells itself. Um, but it is a grape variety that originated from this area. Um, it is a uh, it is a crossing. We sort of we know we've done the DNA on it. We know that it's a crossing of Pinot and uh, Gouet Blanc. We know that it originates from the Bourgogne region, and most likely it was initially planted in the Chablis region. Uh, this is a it's an early budding grape variety. And one of the biggest challenges, and this will kind of segue us into the next slide, which I'm not ready for, just, um, but one of the biggest challenges that you have as a wine grower in that area is that it does tend to bud early, which makes it very susceptible to being damaged by early spring frost. So that's one of the big challenges that they've um, faced in that region. If we kind of back in that timeline that we had much earlier in the slide, we said one of the, um, when they really had started experimenting with dealing with spring frost was in 1959. So in a way, this has been one of the regions that's been on the forefront of, of dealing with um, and figuring out ways to mitigate one of the main challenges for them, which is that. It is not really an area that suffers from a lot of rain in September, so usually, which is when they would usually um, harvest, but that's uh, usually they do, they are saved by spring and their summer, their, their um, fall weather is usually what saves them. But the, the, the beginning is where they tend to kind of get into trouble. And if you look at some of the vintages in 2016, 2017, a lot of the reduction in yield was due to spring frost. So that's kind of one of their really big challenges. Um, in terms of uh, its grape variety, you know, it's, it's a little bit thin skinned, it's a little bit um, prone to botrytis. So I'm sure the astute um, taster might have picked up sometimes in uh, Bargain Whites that some of the dry wines might have some traces of botrytis, especially in wetter years. And you know, I think for some people that kind of brings some of that complexity to the, um, to the table. A relatively thin skinned grape variety. Um, but as we said, one of the biggest challenges that you have there is this um, the cool climate. I love, this is one of the few areas where you're going to have Chardonnay, as we said before, without loads of new oak, um, without loads of, uh, I mean, you might find some leaves, but it's not going to be this kind of very heavy batonnage. Um, if there's oak, usually it would be with the premier crew or the grand crew. More often than not, it is used oak, 
very, very um, well. If there is any new oak, it's actually very carefully managed. But if we're talking about the vast majority of wine coming from that region, which is just Chablis AOC, um, generally we're talking about wines that are stainless steel. Um, for the most part, stainless steel or very neutral oak, very minimal um, leaves, really kind of try bringing out that minerality, that purity of expression um, of that Chardonnay ripening in a marginal climate, where you have this tension between the fruit and the, and the acidity. And have I waxed poetic enough about Chardonnay from Chablis? I think it's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> did I miss anything? No, no. I would add, add on to your uh, um, winemaking crutches concept. And I, th I think that a positive way to look at it is Chardonnay allows you to be a chef with it. You can yeah. in it and, 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 and like that halibut that you have waiting for tonight because it's great with Chablis. You can take halibut and you can just simply pan steer it and put some salt and pepper on it and it's beautiful, right? That's the Chablis version of Chardonnay. Yeah. And then you could also, you know, cover it in other sauces, you know, maybe you go Provencal style and you have tomatoes and olives and garlic on top of it. It still tastes great, but it's a very different experience, right? Yeah. So Chardonnay is like that. It allows you as a winemaker to sort of make a conscious decision of Am I showing it in its naked form or am I showing it with my hand on, as well? And um, that's what makes it a very popular varietal because winemakers like to play with it. And last I checked, people really like to drink it. So let's, I love these pictures. It was so like impactful when I looked at this and thought, oh, it's like Christmas. Oh no, those are smudge pots. They're actually keeping frost <laughs> off of the Grand Cruz and it looks like a little city full of streetlights. And I was like, ah, yeah, that's, that's a very real impression of, oh no, not tonight. This is bad. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I, could, I was thinking, you know, in the day, in, in the day and age of um, Instagram, um, I, I swear I was looking through my Instagram and, you know, high quarantine lockup time. So, you know, April, just after the, the, the two weeks of making sourdough and, and having fun at home has had worn off and the long road ahead was starting to become a, a reality. Um, spending a lot of time on social media, you know, trolling through Instagram. And you see tons of those pictures, especially the one on the upper left-hand side, not necessarily that landscape, but I saw a lot of pictures that looked like that. And at the beginning, I was like, oh my God, that's so pretty. And then you realize actually, it's kind of a big problem um, mm -hmm. because it just means that they're having frost and they had a lot of it in Austria. Um, I also work with Alto Adige and I was kind of seeing a lot of these pictures in a lot of those wine regions, the, the cooler wine regions. But what is interesting about what we see here is aside from the fact it really is actually very pretty to look at. Um, but, you know, as I said before, spring frost is probably one of the biggest realities that they have to contend with every year. Um, and burning smudge pots is something that they started to do in that region back in the 50s. So, as I said, really the, on the forefront of kind of figuring out ways to deal with this early um, frost. The other thing that you're seeing in the bottom is um, spraying, which I don't know if people are familiar with that. But when you know that a frost is coming, um, I actually love that picture on the right because it really mm -hmm. shows you if you have, an, and this, of course, means you have to have the the water systems in place you spray the bud before and it forms a kind of a, an igloo a protective igloo around the the very tender buds um, and so if the frost comes in your leaves are not actually freezing so you kind of do this before the water around the bud freezes and protects it so a really neat and again this is one of the techniques that they established in the, in the Chablis region and we were talking about this earlier Ron but this year um, they had a pretty you know significant a couple of um, early springs and I was looking up some numbers in April the weekend of April 11th through the 14th, um, they had four nights in a row where the temperature dropped down to 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. So they were basically, vineyards were basically just sending everybody out with smudge pots and burning them all over the vineyards. Yeah. Um, and one of the other things that they were starting to do in some cases is to try to push a little bit of this bud break. What they're starting to do in some cases is to actually delay their pruning. Um, so kind of like push the cycle of the vine a little bit further, so prune it a little bit later, hoping that it will bud a little bit later and kind of get you out of the danger zone of spring frost. So, you know, it's, it's this, again, this is not news to anybody making wine in Chablis. They're forever, you know, cold climates. It's like I say, if you don't know how to make wine in a, in a rainy place, you don't need to be in Bordeaux. You know, get out of Bordeaux um, because there are certain realities that just come with being where you are. And um, that's one of the realities of, of Chablis. 
So, um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, definitely a lot of interesting things. And there's still, you know, there's a lot of research that is happening in Chablis in ways to um, mitigate um, spring frosts.